We begin at the integrated headquarters base in the chief of staff's room, as Willem has summoned Shin and Lena for a top secret mission, and for some reason, the lights are off, which is really suspicious and strange to Shin and Lena. The mission was to retake the Republic's northern sectors using the 86 strike package on a takeover operation of the Republic's northern secondary capital of Charite Underground Central Station Terminal. With a wave of a hand, a three-dimensional holographic model of the underground terminal appeared on the screen. It had 14 routes and 25 platforms and lines as well as a large-scale commercial facility attached to it that spanned its seven subterranean levels. The smallest tunnels was about 4 meters in length and width. One wrong move, and a Reagan leaf would get stuck. But that would also mean the legions wouldn't be able to deploy their own main units. It was narrow and convoluted, and one would get lost in it easily, earning the name Charite's Underground Labyrinth. The objective was to eliminate two specific legions known as the Weisel and the Admiral, with a secondary objective to do as little damage to those units as possible, as they wanted to study those legions as they don't have much observational data on those two units. The Weisel is an auto-reproduction type and is presumed to be in the 4th underground level, while the Admiral is a power plant types control unit which is presumed to be held on the 5th level. The Admiral was a massive butterfly-like legion with solar panel wings which usually had a flock of Elder Falters with them, which were all non-combat legions. The Admiral usually relies on solar energy, however, according to reports from the United Kingdom, there's an Admiral that uses geothermal energy instead. The Legion were trying to adapt to cover their weaknesses, and this Admiral is trying to use nuclear fusion to generate electricity. Nuclear fusion is only at the trial stages for the Federacy, which means it's possible that the Legions could do it as well. Shin then asks why Colonel Wenzel isn't here, as she is one of the commanding officers. Willem then responds that this kind of operation doesn't require a briefing, since the Federacy usually just sends data files instead because he wanted to show them something else as well. Lena is now thinking that Willem can't be trusted, and Shin likely had the same thought. Willem then escorted them to a room at the end of the corridor. There was a hollow screen that displayed some type of meeting room, and Ernest's voice boomed from the room, but Ernest was out of the range of the camera. He has been getting complaints regarding the 86's treatment. Then on the screen, an owl appeared that wore an emblem with the five hue flags, which means that she works for the Republic interim government. She demanded that the Federacy returns the 86 to the Republic once the Federacy's army leaves the Republic. As she thinks the 86 were weapons that belonged to the Republic, Lena then saw Willem smirk as she realizes that this is the real reason for summoning them here today, to show them this footage. The woman in the footage, the one called Primver, continued her one-side demands, wanting the 86 back while being racist and ignorant in the process of it. Ernest then mocks her demands, but the woman proceeded to be racist calling the 86's livestock and blaming them for the downfall of the Republic, and that if they were under their command again, it'll be a better outcome, which I wonder how that worked out last time. The footage ended, and Lena was sad that people who think like that are leading the Republic again. Willem then laughs at how stupid and ignorant the superiors of the Republic are, and honestly, I'm laughing with him. Lena felt really bad, she couldn't even look up to Shin who was standing right next to her, but Shin spoke up, so if we're not useful, you intend to abide by their demands? Once we have no further use for you, it's a possibility. There's no reason to act peevish at this point, 86. Aren't you guys living proof that this is what all people eventually boil down to? Shin gave a small sigh. Yes. Anyway, that woman is rapidly gathering support among the old Republic citizens and building up her position with the intern government. She's a leader of the Holy Magnolian Order of Pure Blood, Pure White, Patriotic Knight, and their mans are... Well, as you've heard, is that some type of code name within the Federacy military? I merely call them what they call themselves. Shin let out a heavy, disgusted sigh. And how are these knights related to our mission? You can view this as a warning and nothing more. Let us hope that this is needless fear on my part, shall we? After the meeting, Lena sat lost in thought as she is looking through the personnel files of 139 newly appointed processors. Grief then tells Lena that Annette and 2nd Lieutenant Jaeger are coming today and should be arriving any minute. Lena was going to go greet them herself, but was swamped with paperwork that she had forgotten. Grief smirked and tells her that she sent Shin to greet them. And that's where the prologue of Volume 4 happens. And I'm not going to cover over the prologue since it was covered in the last video. If you haven't seen it, be sure to check it out. I'll leave it in the description down below. As we transition to Shin and Annette, with Berntold holding the luggage, Annette asked Shin if it was Lena who sent him to greet her. Shin answered her question honestly and wondered what the point of the question was. Then thought the reason for her attitude was because citizens of the Republic saw the 86s as pigs in human form. And Shin goes on to say, If you find being greeted by an 86 unpleasant, I apologize. Since you're appointed to the laboratory, I doubt we have to see each other after this. If that bothered me, I wouldn't have volunteered to come here in the first place. And besides, I'm a technical expert in the sensory resonance field. I'll have to closely interact with you processors anyways. 
A voice echoed down the runway. It was Lena who was dashing towards them. Captain Nozin, I'll handle showing Major Penrose around. Master Sergeant Berthold, please take care of our luggage. Yes ma'am, let's go. Raiden who just happened to pass by watched them and asked, what was that about? Shin replied who didn't have any idea what the problem was. Beats me. Raiden then mentions that he came here to meet with the newbies and the kid who got left behind which was 2nd Lieutenant Dustin Yeager, who has actually made a cameo during episode 23 in the anime. Raiden turned his gaze to the second transfer plane which just opened. A small 86 boy from that plane had recognized Shin and Raiden. The boy's name was Rito. He was Agate, the same race as Kurina. He was Shin and Raiden's subordinate before both of them joined the Spearhead Squadron, who was also joining the 86 strike package. Later on, 2nd Lieutenant Dustin Yeager then introduced himself to Shin and the rest of the gang. He was an Alban Republic citizen who forgot protecting their homeland and volunteered for the strike package. Dustin was a student before the large scale offense and a lot of his classmates were 86 who died battling the Legion. And he couldn't do anything about it and he carries that stigma but doesn't want his future kids to bear it. So to break that cycle, he as a Republic citizen chooses to fight. Next, 2nd Lieutenant Shinin Ida, captain of the Brisingamin unit known as the Queen's Knight, finally gets to introduce herself to Shin and the Spearhead Squadron. Her right eye was dark as indigo, while her left eye was white as snow, giving the impression that she had only one eye, and was likely the inspiration for her personal name, Cyclops. In a briefing room with all the processors in one place, Shinin spoke from the center of the room. By the way, did you get your toy back, Lady Killer? The one you dropped in the fire field six months ago? She stood eye to eye to Shin. I don't know the specifics, but don't go venting your anger at a woman who could have been a total stranger for all you know, dumbass. That was beyond embarrassing. I won't deny that, but what right do you have to say that to me? Every right. I don't care if you're the Reaper of the Eastern Front. You have no right to diss our majesty, got it? Sides. Weren't you supposed to die two years ago? At least know how to stay in your grave, damn it. You're all bark, aren't you? She didn't launch her tall form forward. Take that. As soon as she shouted, she tried to kick Shin, which he evaded by bending his body half a step back. Lena tells him to stop, but Theo tells her to let them duke it out like how a pack of wolves or stray dogs fight for dominance in the pack. And looking around, the 86s were moving chairs to get a better view of the fight, and no one was planning on stopping them. At this point of the light novel, they don't mention who says what around this part, so I'm just going to assume it's all Raiden unless it was specified. He goes on to say, Back in the Republic, the 86s didn't care about ranks, so they decide the positions of captains and vice captains themselves. But name bearers have their pride, and won't follow anyone weaker to them into battle. And usually, it's the strongest person that gets picked as a captain. But it wasn't like that for the Spearhead Squadron, as Shin's name and skill was already well known, so they unanimously agreed that Shin would be the captain, and Raiden would be the vice captain. And that would be for the better, as the captains had to fill out the paperwork as part of their role. And both Shin and Raiden were adopted by guardians that gave them better education than most children in their position. As Shin and Shiden continue their spar, Shiden tries a spinning kick as a feint, but switches to a high kick, which Shin was unable to dodge, then takes a blow to his upper right arm. And Shiden made a small tear in his uniform with a few drops of blood coming out. Shin's blood red eyes grew colder. He pushed her leg off him, at the same time he took a step forward to close the gap between them, which Shiden hopped on one leg as intended. Shin then used the tip of his foot to trip Shiden and lifted her up, she was airborne for a moment, then Shin caught her by the neck and slammed her towards the floor. But halfway through, Shin let her go to show her some mercy. As Shin crashed on the floor, everyone went silent. Suddenly, Shin twitched. She kicked up, and using the momentum, got to her feet, jabbed her finger at Shin and complained. Asshole, that would have killed me if I didn't brace myself. You're assuming I care if you live or die? Were you actually trying to kill me, you son of a bitch? Tch. Oh, you pissed me off. See, your majesty? This guy is the kind of bastard who can raise a hand to a woman without a second thought. You're the one who snapped at me like a rabbit dog. Now shut up and stop being a sore loser. And Shin was indeed correct, a loss was a loss. Shiden walked off leaving Shin at the center of the room. Shin continues, Now then, if anyone has a problem with me taking command, step right up. Not a single hand went up until, When in Rome, do as Romans do. I'm up next. It was Dustin who removed his uniform enthusiastically. Anju who was next to Dustin stopped him. Listen up, 2nd Lieutenant Jaeger. You can talk a big game after you beat me. Uh, no. I can't fight a girl. <laughs> Come at me, Anju smirked. Anju then easily threw Dustin over her shoulder and he unfortunately went on to deliver a passionate kiss to the nearby table. Afterwards, it was nightfall. In her room in the barracks, Lena apologized to Annette as she never intended for her to meet Shin like that. And Annette said it was okay as she whispered, I couldn't tell it was Shin at first either. He's so, so different. As we fast forward to a month later, to April 2150, the Federacy has finished its preparations and is now ready to go on the offense. 
the 86 is made up of most of the strike package's 7 squadrons, and when they got back to the Republic in the capital of Liberté et Egalité, they were welcomed with banners that said things like, Go back to the 86 sector, 86, or turn this pure white country to human hands. The white pigs of the Republic still hating on the 86s, never once realizing that they brought this fate upon themselves. Shin then came to Lena's office to confirm some documents and asked her, What's with all the commotion over bleach and detergent? Bleach and detergent? They keep saying, Give us back our pure white, and Lena bursted out in laughter. Sure enough, when taken out of context, the Republic people did sound like something out of a commercial for a laundry detergent. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's nothing you need to apologize for, Lena. It doesn't matter what we say. Those people won't listen. They're like dogs who are all bark, no bite. You lose the moment you pay them any mind. All they can do is just be loud, and you can always just laugh them off like you did just now. So don't let it bother you, Lena. It's not your fault. So don't make that face. Lena smiled bitterly. She realized he was worried about her, which made her happy. But I can't help but to be bothered by this. I'm a citizen of the Republic too, and be ready to hear that a lot throughout the series. Shin felt silent for a moment. Leaving such things as they are, even when you know they're wrong, is tantamount to supporting them. Not correcting their actions is shameful as a fellow citizen of the Republic. She thought she saw a flash of what looked like anger or indignation in his eyes. You're different from them. We all know that. Whatever they say or do has no bearing on you. The other day, as the squadron was on his way back after an exercise, they found acorns littering the road. The Federacy soldiers didn't seem to mind, but Lena, a Republic citizen, understood the meaning behind it. The Republic's industries were originally agriculture and stock farming. The acorns were traditionally fodder for pigs. But the 86s never learned the culture and the history of the Republic, so they had no idea what the meaning behind it was. So the 86s didn't seem to care for it and they just laughed it off and just make jokes about their actions. I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. Yep. Lena's still bothered by what the Republic are doing. She tells Greece that the 86 sector no longer exists. We're not ruling over them. They should be allowed to openly oppose this hatred. And how exactly do you suggest they go on about that? Lena blinked at the sudden question. How? What do you mean, Colonel Wenzel? This is my impression from knowing them, from knowing Captain Nozen for a year now. Those kids aren't strong. They simply understood that they had to be strong to survive. And in the process of trying to become strong, they instead cut off anything that made them weak. Experiencing that blatant hatred day in and day out cut it all away from their hearts and made them numb. Telling them to stand up for themselves in the face of senseless adversity might seem like a natural response, but isn't that the same as asking them to feel pain again? It wasn't that they weren't hurt, it was that they hurt so much that they cut off anything that allowed them to feel pain. We transition to the processor training as Shen Hu is the captain has to decide which troops go to which squadron which is pretty much just everyone going to their usual squadron. But he wasn't sure where to put Dustin, who lacked the resolve and skill. So to balance things out, Anju decides to claim him. Later on, Annette has a meeting with Shin as part of her job as a technical advisor. She asks him if he actually remembers her, as she thinks Shin does remember her, but he is just playing as if he doesn't know her. She thinks that he must hate her because she was one of the reasons why he was sent to the 86th sector. She thought he would say something sooner or later, but he never brought anything up. Shin then looked at her with confusion and apologizes and glances at her as if she was a complete stranger. Back to the corridor, Annette tells Lena that he doesn't remember anything about her, and he doesn't remember anything before he was sent to the internment camp. Annette was fine if Shin never forgave her for back then, but she still wanted to apologize to atone for her sins, but she couldn't do that if Shin didn't remember. Lena then goes to confront Shin, who was reclined against his rig's armor with an open book. He wasn't reading, but he seemed to be lost in thought. I hope you're not too upset, but do you really not remember anything? Even if you don't, maybe talking about it could help some of the memories return. Hearing I had a childhood friend made me feel like I did, but that's all. I can't remember a name or a face. I heard they've located the house my family used to live in, so I went to see it. And Shin doesn't remember anything about it, but he isn't bothered by it, as he can defeat the Legion even if he doesn't remember his family or hometown. If anything, he thinks those memories will get in his way. Having something to lose would be just a distraction. Having something to hold dear would just cause him to hesitate. If he didn't cut away all the things that were unnecessary for battle, he would never survive. When all I could think about was killing my brother, I had a reason to live. But when I looked back and realized that I couldn't even remember what he was like, it... It just felt a little lonely. Ashton could never remember his brother. That was why he was happy when he found out that Lena remembered his brother. Lena mentions that Shin's grandfather is still alive and that he's a high-ranking noble of a warrior family, like Shuri told Lena that the name of the Nozin was reserved for their clan, and was rare in both the Empire and the Federacy. When Shin was adopted by Ernest, his grandfather wanted to meet him. Shin's grandfather requested to all of his superiors, including Greeth, and more recently, Lena, but Shin didn't consent to meeting him. Your grandfather might remember your brother and family. He might have pictures of them. Maybe you should meet him. 
Why would I want that? I've never met this old man who calls himself my grandfather. I don't remember any stories of my father that I'll be able to tell him. What would I even say? What good meeting him now do me? It would be a hollow meeting for both of us. It was a grim reminder that what was lost could not be compensated for. It was then Lena realized, Shin said he didn't remember, but maybe it wasn't that he couldn't remember, but rather, he didn't want to remember. The same goes for Major Penrose. If she wanted to apologize to make it like nothing happened, she would have been better off forgetting herself, and never coming to me about it. He was better off not knowing what he'd forgotten, what he'd lost. That was Shin's stance. As we transition to a new scene, since Lena is now a tactical commander, she was granted a personal command car. Its call sign was Vanadis. Theo was also there for the time she picked up her new whip. Well, I like to think I outdid myself this time. Feel free to praise me, Lena. Emblazoned on the side of the vehicle was a silhouette of a woman clad in a crimson dress. Bloody Regina, Lena's personal mark. The fact that she was counted among their ranks made her heart swell with pride, and the fact that he arranged such a surprise for her made her so happy. You could have just drawn a white pig in a red dress, you know? A smile came over Theo's paint-stained lips at her playful remark. What? No. No way. I don't know why you're bringing white pigs into this. You still bothered by the bleachers? At some point, it had been decided that the nickname for the Order of the Something Something Knights would be the Bleachers. Yes, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. That's such a drag. Just forget about it, it's fine. Besides, if I painted a white pig on your personal mark, I don't want to think about what Shin would do to me. I don't want to die just yet. Why mention Shin? He looked at her out of the corner of his eye. What? Are you serious? Don't tell me you haven't noticed. Notice what? Theo heaved the deep sigh from the pit of his stomach. Holy shit, you're dense. I mean, at this point, all I can say is poor Shin. It's like, blatantly obvious. Or never mind. If you don't get it, you don't get it. Explaining it feels like trouble. Didn't Shin tell you to stop making that tortured face? He's right, you know. Nobody's blaming you for anything, which makes your 24-7 one-woman pity party especially painful to watch. You can stop now, okay? We transitioned over to Shin and Raiden at the base firing range. Going against self-propelled mine holograms, Shin was using a technique called tactical reloading, where he would fire the needed bullets of his pistol and keep one bullet in the chamber of the pistol. And without finishing the magazine, he would inject it and swap it for another one. The point of this technique was to prevent loss of seconds in a gunfight, since reloading time can make the difference between life and death, and this would be useful in the later chapters of this volume. Raiden realized something was up with Shin, and Shin tells him it's about Lena. Since the harassment business about the bleachers has been bothering her, Shin didn't really care about the bleachers, but he does care about Lena. And when something bothers Lena, it bothers him. Raiden then asks him, if all you did was dwell on the things that pissed you off the most, how much more pissed off could you possibly get? Which Shin has never admitted it, but he hated the height difference between him and Raiden. Shin goes on, I'm a citizen of the Republic, she says. Is she really so attached just because she was born in a specific place? Or happens to be the same color as those people? It's just as true for Major Penrose and the Federacy, too. I don't understand why they're so fixated on our pasts. As Shin tells Raiden, he doesn't remember a thing about Annette. Most of the 86s, including Shin and Raiden, after becoming a processor at the internment camps, have forgotten about their homeland. The 86s had the mindset that people shape themselves by their own hands, through their own flesh and blood, and the comrades they fought with and relied on. The thought of holding a sense of belonging to a nation because of a land or race they never chose to be born to was foreign to them. After another strategy meeting ended, Annette watched Shin leave as Federica calls her out. Make those lovey-dovey eyes at him all you want. That man has no obligation to guess at your feelings as he is now. She called her a derogatory term in Giyad that meant white hair. Yes, I suppose your power holds monopoly over that field, doesn't it, all-seeing witch? It's easy to see when it's the only thing on your mind. Your remorseful eyes keep chasing Shine with that long gaze. It would bother me even if I were to try to ignore it. If he says he doesn't know you, then that's the end of it. All that remains is for you to come to terms with it. But if I don't apologize, I'll never be able to move forward. What you fear is not being unable to move forward, but being unable to go back. All you wish is to return to the relationship the two of you've had in your youth when you're happy. You wish to make it so your sin is undone. Even as you say you've hurt Shine, all you wish is to find peace without once seeing the scars inflicted on him. Annette froze in place, and Frederica glared at her with her eyes like fire. A pyrope's crimson eyes, the same as Shin's. Shine, and all those people you have witted down to nearly nothing have their hands full with protecting themselves. And if you intend to make their load any heavier, I shall stand in your way as their enemy. Afterwards, Lena invited Shin to take a trip through Libete et Igalite, the capital of San Magnolia, with the intent of trying to jog Shin's memories. It's been about six months since it's been retaken, but the capital has been recovering nicely. Lena then asked Shin to go to Palace Lune, which is a location where the Republic holds their revolution festival, which they promised each other that they would see sometime. Lena proceeds to ask Shin the same thing. She asks him back in the 86th sector. 
Is there something you want to see right now, Shin? Somewhere you want to go? Something you want to do? Shin thought about it for a while, but dodged the question by asking Lena the same thing. Well, let's see. For now, I would like to go hunting and fishing in the village behind the Roost Camera base after the mission is over. And maybe see St. Jetter. Oh, and the ocean too. I've never seen it. When Lena mentioned the ocean, Shin's smile suddenly deepened. And if you read it to volume 6, you know why. That sounds nice. One day for sure. Another thing that was on the list, but Lena didn't mention was just walking through town with Shin was one of the things she always wanted. And seeing Lena quicken her pace from embarrassment, Shin suddenly brought up the matter with Annette. And they get in a bit of a disagreement on the topic. And he asked Lena, why doesn't she and Annette just cut it all away? And why ask Shin to remember when they can't bear to face it themselves? Lena responds, that's because, well, my past and my homeland are part of what makes me who I am and I can't cut part of myself away. I think the reason not remembering is less painful for you is because they're part of you too. I can be myself even if I don't remember my home or my family, and I think those memories are unnecessary for me the way I am now. But didn't the fact that you couldn't remember your own brother made you feel lonely? That's... It's true. I didn't want to forget him, but if I were to remember him, I would. At that moment, they get interrupted by some racist bystanders. A random child said, Mommy, why is that thing got those weird colors? The child was pointing at Shin, then the child went on insulting my man Shin's appearance. Then her fake mother comes by, pretending to scold her child. Shin gives zero shits about what they said and let him off the hook. And we hear the mother shit talk Shin as soon as they left. And Lana heard that, and this pissed her off. But Shin stopped her from going after that racist mother and tells her to ignore it. But Lana then goes on to Shin, how do you expect me to ignore it? She just openly insulted you, even now, and all the way up to now too. You came to save them. One could say you even fought for them. I'm not fighting for the Republic. I never have. Shin sighed and continued. I'm used to the Republic citizens saying whatever they want. I don't particularly see it as an insult. And no matter what I say, they'll never listen. Would you take a pig squealing to heart, Lena? It's the same thing to me. As far as the Republic citizens are concerned, the 86 are just livestock. His tone was now so calm and collected that it almost bordered on cruelty. Lena clenched her fist. Shin, I'm a Republic citizen too. Shin felt silent for a moment, looking displeased. Right, I'm sorry. I don't think of you as livestock, but I'm still a Republic citizen. You're different from them. I am. She finally realized what Shin meant. Lena was different from them. The white pigs of the Republic are just human-shaped garbage, unlike me. That's what you're trying to say? The 86 didn't take offense to the behavior of the white pigs, nor did they try to correct it. They could pretend to speak in human tongue, but they would forever lack comprehension. They simply didn't know good from bad. That was all anyone could expect from those pitiful white pigs. There is no point of being offended by pigs. Even if you demand a common sense out of them, there would be no way for them to understand you. And there would probably never be any mutual understanding between them. Even if Lena didn't expect anything out of the Republic anymore, seeing that nothing has changed even now made her sad. Lena goes on, So by calling them pigs, by thinking them as fundamentally different from themselves, you all feel the same way as them, don't you? For a long moment, Shin stood silent, and then he plainly, calmly nodded. Yes. And that ends chapter 2. Congratulations to everyone that made it this far into the video. A lot of things happen in this chapter, which is why it does take a while to make these videos. And I try to make these videos at the highest quality, so chapter 3 might be ways away. But I have a lot of fun making these videos, and that's what matters. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below, and I'll see you guys next time.